Now today I'll be talking about the diver's ear, and of course uh, I'm partial to this subject because uh, it is uh, a reoccurring theme in my practice. Uh, it, it is the most frequent diving injury that uh, I see among novice divers, and uh, I also see it among flyers, and the, uh, stewardess, uh, the, uh, the diving public and the flying public seem to be the, the most interested in uh, ear equalization. Um, a part of the problem is, uh, is due to misunderstandings of anatomy. A lot of people have uh, a difficult time clearing, but they don't quite understand why. So I'm going to be talking today about middle ear equalization under pressure. Uh, I've been diving for 30 years and here in Seattle as a physician in family practice for 20 years. The, um, the, the topic that we're talking about, this middle ear damage, doctors call it barotrauma. And uh, the, the main reason I found this topic so interesting is because it really is a preventable uh, injury. And uh, when we send novice divers into the pool, when we try to uh, teach diving to students, oftentimes they, uh, they go in the water, put on their dive gear, and that's when they find out that they have trouble equalizing. Uh, so uh, my approach is something different. My approach is to try to identify the individuals who are going to have problems and to uh, try to teach them some skills before they injure their ears rather than uh, uh, after the fact. I, I've um, recognized as a syndrome over the years and that's and that syndrome I have coined ear fear. Uh, it's a, uh, a condition where um, a novice diver or a student comes into my office and they're not quite sure how to equalize. In fact, they're not quite sure they like the sensation. They want to dive and they want to get their ears to equalize, but when you tell them how to do it, they wrinkle up their nose and they say, oh, I don't think I want to do that. Well, uh, uh, part of what we're going to do today is to recognize ear fear and, and say there must be a way to help these people to uh, uh, equalize without the fear of injuring their ears. and. Uh, and along those lines, I'm going to uh, address uh, eight different methods of equalization. So uh, we'll cover the gamut of uh, both passive and active methods uh, for, for uh, pressurization. You know, the, uh, this anatomy of the middle ear is well known, and, and uh, it was first described by an anatomist back in the 1500s. Um, he, this, uh, Bartolomeo Eustachio. Well, it doesn't really matter whether you call his uh, tube the Eustachian tube or the Eustachian tube. These are just uh, uh, considered to be uh, synonymous. This tube, and I'd like to go now to a model here. Uh, the tube is a variable patency. The Eustachian tube starts in the back of the throat and goes into the middle ear and this tube is, was uh, designed by Mother Nature to ventilate the middle ear, to allow pressures to equalize across the eardrum. Starting from the outside, you have the external ear, external auditory canal, the eardrum or tympanic membrane, and, and the famous ossicles, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup of the middle ear. We'll take a little closer look at those later. But those bones attach to the cochlea the hearing apparatus of the ear. And the reason the eardrum works so finely is because it, 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 is, um, it is allowed to vibrate in the middle ear and air is supposed to be present on both sides and there's not supposed to be a big gradient across this eardrum. But when you dive, of course, water pressure tries to, to push the eardrum back into the ear. So you get uh, more and more pressure pushing the eardrum in and, and uh, equalization takes place when you 
somehow managed to get air up the eustachian tube into the middle ear to balance the pressures across the membrane. If that balance occurs, it feels comfortable. Diving is okay. But if the balance doesn't occur, if pressurization continues from the outside, then the eardrum gets pulled over the ossicles, pulled over the malleus, the little bone here that attaches to the eardrum. And that's when you start to get a little tear in the, uh, in the tissues. Well, you can get a big tear. You can get uh, blood in the eardrum and, and blood in the middle ear. And so uh, that becomes a problem for the diver. So uh, <clears throat> the, um, oh, I meant to mention that the, the eustachian tube has variable patency. Some individuals have a wide open eustachian tube and they just have to move their jaw or perhaps blow into their mask a little bit and the uh, and air will easily flow up the eustachian tube, balance the pressures and, and so you see many divers who can descend effortlessly without any trouble. On the other hand, uh, there are people at the other end of the spectrum with a very small eustachian tube. Perhaps this bone is a bit more prominent, uh, perhaps her facial anatomy a little different, but for whatever reason, the eustachian tube has uh, this um, problem where, um, where uh, air doesn't flow easily in all individuals. I see probably 10% of, uh, of the diving public to ha having problems occasionally with diving. Now I'd like to show you what the normal ear looks like. This is a picture of my daughter's eardrum. And uh, we took it the other day. Uh, it shows beautiful anatomy. In fact, you can't even really see the eardrum very well. It looks like a saran wrap draped across the malleus. And, and this, this is a malleus or the hammer of the eardrum and this uh, little bone here, the lateral process. Uh, medical students learn to identify these, the anatomy of the, uh, of the middle ear. Uh, oh, up here you can even see a little nerve draped across here called the corda, corda tympani. This, uh, this is uh, one of the nerves that goes on to innervate the face. The, the bones of the middle ear go up and then back down again. Uh, this is the uh, incus. Uh, the uh, other side of the incus as it comes down, and the stapes goes back into the, uh, into the cochlea. So you can imagine that you can just barely see the stapes going back that way. Um, in this view, you can even see what's called a round window niche. This is where uh, one of the membranes that's attached to the cochlea sits. You can see you barely see a dark area right here. So. Uh, uh, only 14-year-olds have eardrums that look like this. Um, here's what a normal uh, Puget Sound diver's ear looks like. Um, <laughs> what you see is uh, a person who's been exposed to cold water for many years, and, uh, and folks like this develop uh, exostoses, or little lumps in their, in their ear canals. This is not dangerous. These lumps uh, just look funny when you look at them uh, in the uh, otoscope. Now, here we have a problem that I hope you never face. And this is, a, this is of course, hemotympanum, or uh, a bloody eardrum. Uh, what, what you're seeing here is an eardrum that's been damaged by water pressure, pushing against it very hard. And, um, and blood is now accumulating behind the eardrum. And of course, it's now uh, ruptured out through a small hole in the eardrum, which you can't see here, and is draining right out the ear. Now, this hurts, and it takes uh, two weeks or more, sometimes more, to, uh, to get back to normal. Uh, sometimes a, a diver who's, who's had uh, a uh, ruptured eardrum will have hearing loss, too, so we want to try to make sure that this doesn't happen. 